Good morning. This is Casey O'Brien, Executive Director of the National Cyber Watch Center. And I want to welcome everybody to the first webinar series of the 2015 season. Um, and so, a couple things before we actually get into it. One, I wanted to start with the, some webinar protocol. Main thing being when you're um, not asking a question or talking to please um, mute your phone and or microphone and I can I can already hear some background noise from a couple people I'm going to go ahead and I can mute people here, here. Um, rather folks do it themselves so that's the first thing the second thing is if you have questions during the webinar there's a couple ways we can handle this one is we'll we'll leave time after each slide for folks to ask questions uh, and that's one option. Option two is there is a chat feature in in Wex, and depending on how your the browser you're using and the operating system and whatnot, you may have a drop down screen at the top middle of your of your screen. Uh, it says chat, or you may have a window uh, along the right hand side. This, of course, is for the folks who are who are connecting to Webex via their computer. Um, so if you're, if you're simply calling in, then again we'll, we'll leave time at the end of at the end of slide to ask questions. Uh, and third, the third part of the webinar protocol has to do with just any technical problems that you encounter. Um, you can send an email to me, C O'Brien, C O B R I E N, at National Cyber Watch. Dot org. And I'll, I'll put that in the chat window for those who are um, on Webex. But again, that's C O B as in boy R I E N at nationalcyberwatch.org if you have any technical problems. All right. 2015 webinar series, uh, we get into today's discussion. Uh, and that and that is it's the last Friday of each month. It's an hour long, starts at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And we have some great topics planned for this year. Today is uh, a, a resources available from the Cybersecurity Education Consortium CSEC, and you're going to hear from some folks talking about the very resources they have available. March 27th is making sense of virtualization degree certificates certifications for colleges universities I hear from Ernie friend Ernie friend from Florida State College at Jacksonville about um, degree and certificate programs that they've set up and we're talking about virtualization in regards to um, storage um, VMware Citrix etc cetera, etc cetera. April 4th is the National Cyber League for the classroom now in its fourth year so um, what is the NCL and how can you include it in your in your classes to help uh, enhance the types of hands-on experience that your students are getting? We have May 29th, National Centers of Academic Excellence and Information Assurance Cyber Defense Program Updates and Support, which was the most popular webinar we did in 2014. In fact, it was so popular we ended up running three additional on our topics on that specific topic. Um, we're going to not do a webinar in June and July, primarily because summer months, most folks aren't around. We'll pick up again on August 28th. And August 28th is question and answer with representatives from Advanced Cyber Forensics Education Consortium. And then September 25th is question and answer time with representatives from CyberWatch West. Um, and I believe that there may be a couple in October. Um, I don't have the sheet in front of me, but that gives you a sense of the kinds of topics. Um, we record all the webinars and they get archived on the National Cyber Watch Center YouTube channel. So today, Cybersecurity Education Consortium, CSEC Resources. Um, Casey O'Brien, I'm the executive. Executive Director of the National Cyber Watch Center. I'll be the moderator. There's my email for those that are not on WebEx. Uh, it's cobrian at nationalcyberwatch.org. And I will be the moderator of the, of the entire 2015 National Cyber Watch Center webinar series. 
Our panelists include Cheryl Hale, the Oklahoma Department of Career Tech, Robert Hamilton, also with the Oklahoma Department of Career Tech, um, Matthew Maynard, not sure if he's going to be joining us today or not, um, but he's with Francis Tuttle Technology Center, and Nick Gaunt, who's on the call, Central Technology Center. Um, and they're going to talk a little bit about this CSEC, a little bit about their history, um, what's been their primary mandate and focus, and specifically some of the resources they want to share with our members include um, data instructional resources. I think Robert has upwards of about four gigabytes worth of instructional resources available for faculty, um, and he's going to talk about that. Um, and they also have some, they were going to talk a little bit about instrumentation and process control security and then some resources um, available in Moodle, instructional resources available in Moodle relating to cybersecurity. And there'll be some time for Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton to Cheryl and Robert. So give me one second here. I'm going to make them the presenters. Carol and Robert, you guys are now the presenters, and they're going to go ahead and share their screen and take it from here. Thank you, Casey, and hello to everyone. My name is Carol Hale, and I'm with the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education, which is our state agency for career and technology education in the state of Oklahoma. I have uh, approximately 29 technology centers throughout the state located on 59 campuses with also 400 programs in high schools. I will speak to you today, though, re really representing the Cybersecurity Education Consortium. We are also a regional advanced technological education center for National Science Foundation. The primary mission of CSEC, as we abbreviate, is number one, we really set out to create a well-trained cybersecurity workforce for our particular region, which we define our region as Oklahoma and seven of neighboring states. Since we're, we don't have a national focus, but more of a regional focus, we wanted to really try to advance homeland security initiatives throughout those eight states, as well as Look at different ways that we can support law enforcement efforts in the cybersecurity arena. We have approximately uh, 45 active members in eight states, and the graphic that you see sort of really represents our growth and development uh, since really 2004 all the way to 2014. Are we sharing right along? Hey, Carol, just, excuse me, this is Casey. Right now, all we're seeing is um, Outlook screen. All right, take a minute and make sure we've got the right monitor. Actually, there you go, yeah. I, uh, I got three monitors, so I was sharing the right one. <laughs> there you go. Okay, perfect. Oh, Thank you. I would have three monitors. Okay, great. Well, now you can actually sort of see uh, the growth and development of uh, the Cybersecurity Education Consortium. We originally started out in Oklahoma, really with a, a Oklahoma focus, and then as we became more mature as a consortium, we actually branched out into those seven surrounding states with uh, really our second uh, National Science Foundation grant. In order to be an at what we consider an active CSA member, uh, we require each of our institutions to participate in a pretty rigorous total of 25 days of instructor training based upon our core curriculum. You also be required to actually develop a either a certificate program or a degree program. That's how we. Uh, sort of monitor whether or not an institution is really active. And are you actually developing a certificate or degree program focused on cybersecurity? 
We also require our principal instructors to obtain security-related industry credentials within 18 months of training. And we also require them to have specific documented requirements for student entrance requirements, such as background checks, uh, code of ethics for students to sign, and liability responsibilities. Our instructors also uh, participate in what we call curriculum working groups, as well as do their best to align their program to what was originally the CNSS certifications, but now we're migrating to uh, the Center of Academic Excellence Knowledge and Skills Unit, so we're in transition there. I'll let Robert comment a little bit more on that. Great. Our main objectives as a consortium are threefold. Number one, to develop curriculum and development and dissemination. Disseminate what we've developed really throughout our consortium. We have a web repository that we use uh, as well as migrating into other technologies. It is to provide instructor training and help technical assistance for them to build their programs. And then, of course, lastly, uh, really right back to our main mission, is workforce development. We really want to uh, train a highly skilled cybersecurity workforce. Uh, there are some of our just basic statistics uh, in reference to where we are as far as the number of students participating in our programs. We have 121 actively uh, active trained faculty members. Since 2004, we've had over a thousand students actually complete associate degrees. 250 complete bachelor's degrees because we actually have articulation agreements with four universities. And then almost 1,500 students actually completing certificate programs. As of June 2014, we had over a thousand and declared security degree majors. So you'll see that we're going to be multiplying over the next few years the number of actual degrees that we have, and um, our enrollment just continues. You know, the 2,337 is a duplicate enrollment, uh, but still great interest in all of our program. As well as we have an industry training branch in which we actually train incumbent workers in cybersecurity. Our curriculum is based upon five courses. Um, originally, it was information assurance principles, security, electronic commerce, network security, and security management, and network forensics. I've migrated really to more of a digital forensics as we have grown. For each of the core curriculum, there's five days of professional development training that we provided our faculty. Some of the key features of our curriculum is we've really tried to include both the technical, operational, and material attention address legal and ethical issues uh, from the first course. The consortium, we have uh, approximately 123 articulation agreements. Uh, and of course, we offer certificate AS and AAS programs. All of our programs are aligned to industry certifications. And many of our institutions have are offering the CNSS certifications currently. Actually, eight of our member institutions actually are um, CA2Y institutions. I'm going to turn it over to Robert, and he's going to chat with you about our physical system security.
Okay. Um, focusing in on control system security, I'm not sure how many of you are, are uh, really speed on just exactly what that is. So kind of a quick overview there is Basically, it deals with the critical infrastructure. The uh, feds identify 17 critical infrastructure sectors uh, that uh, are critical to the nation and, and its economy. And so um, control systems are used pretty much across the board. Uh, there's some key ones that we're focusing in on. One of the challenges that we run into with that is it's basically across cross disciplinary. You have your SCADA technicians, which are more on the engineering side, and so with training I've developed on that, we look at trying to focus in on uh, the uh, industrial control system SCADA security at the application level and get them up to speed on the regular IT security at awareness level. And then we flip that for the IT guys that also have to uh, integrate the enterprise network into those control system networks. And so then the uh, Industrial control system security would be at the awareness level, and the IT security would be at the application level. Questions on that? Uh, some of the resources that I've developed is I do I have a, a three-day instructor training workshop that I've been offering, uh, and so I have the PowerPoints, the labs. Uh, I, I developed a PLC trainer that's using that. Uh, we have a proposed syllabus for community colleges to use as a template. Uh, uh, OSU Institute of Technology uh, has some proposed courses and a course that they've they've taught in that. And uh, also we have a uh, basically control system security outline. So that outlines all the different topics that you could choose from uh, to cover. Um, Simple Tech, uh, Nick Gaunt, who will be uh, talking to you after this, uh, is one of the areas where we're dealing with that. And he'll be talking with you about the Network Security Administration section. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Pipeline Training Center that we have. And it's dealing with customized business and industry training, where we're training those incumbent workers. And so the curriculum that's been developed there is uh, these courses, Introduction to Pipelines, uh, programmable logic controls, uh, getting into control logic systems, and then looking at how uh, industrial networking and SCADA systems are networked. And then the security piece that we really developed is we have a, a security awareness uh, workshop, uh, one-day workshop that's uh, there for, and we've been focusing in on the oil and gas industry. So several of our companies uh, have every single one of their employees go through that security awareness training. And a three-day advanced security uh, works that we do for the uh, technicians that are actually securing those control networks. Here's some uh, pictures of uh, we have an indoor uh, pipeline training simulator. I need to update these pictures. Uh, this was while it was still under construction. It's completed and up and running now, so this doesn't show all of the uh, all of the components and everything. Uh, we had. Uh, a great deal of industry uh, cooperation with with this effort. Uh, we've had probably close to oh, over a quarter million dollars worth of equipment donated by uh, a lot of different companies to build this simulator because it is using real world uh, components that would actually uh, be using out there in the field. Uh, just a quick picture of some uh, uh, trainers we built that have a couple of uh, have a PLC and some. Some uh, routers and various components and laptops that we interface with that. Here's our control room that we have set up. Uh, this is in a different area, and of course we have closed circuit TV so that the operator can monitor the, the terminal, and, and then there's the, the uh, HMI, as they call it. Uh, Matt, I don't think, has been able to join us, so I'll kind of talk about what we got there. Francis Tuttle. Uh, we have two uh, time programs going there. Of course, we have the one, the cybersecurity traditional uh, uh, program going where they can uh, become cybersecurity specialists. And then Matt Maynard that was going to join us, he uh, works with the advanced manufacturing. And uh, at the bottom, it shows the SCADA manufacturing energy systems, systems emphasis. 
You know that? Yeah. Okay. Great. I was just uh, just get covering your stuff. Trying to. Yeah, I've been trying to talk, and I finally got. I guess uh, with my computer, I got to go to the actual with the uh, mic. Right. Okay. So I had to do some finagling. Do you have uh, any slides or anything you want to present, or you want to use what I have? I can use what you have there. It looks like you've about got everything there for me as far as the classes I teach. Uh, some of the other initiatives I'm on, I got to have some slides that I'm on for as uh, standards being written right now in the industry. And use also, I've been part of a couple of committees there to say that I'm willing to talk about. Uh, I'm an active member in the, the ISA, International Society of Automation, and right now they've written numerous standards dealing with uh, cybersecurity for its ISA 99, or uh, we're calling it now. It's actually got its own. Let me pull it up here, make sure I quote it because it never came for a minute. Uh, if I can uh, get a slide on here, I don't know how I'll operate this. Yeah, Matt, we would have to give you a, a control of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, then how would you give me control? Uh, here, just a second. I feel like it came up. Can you guys see it? Oh, well, yours, Matthew? Yeah. You see it? No, Matthew, this is Casey O'Brien, the moderator. So if you want to share your screen, you'll have to go to menu options up top and click share my screen and then we can all see it. Uh, in that case, I I would just recommend that we use the slides that Robert and Cheryl have, and um, right. Is that, okay, thank you. Hey, I had control, so I need to get control back. Oh, I got. Okay, now we're just seeing a gray screen. Okay. Seeing like a blackboard type page. Yeah. Can you can you increase the font size? I can't. How about can you see that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm this uh, cybersecurity uh, ISA 99 special control system, which basically. Uh, Right, this is a one I put together for the uh, what we're doing for our local members, yeah, our members in the whole global community. Uh, and the, and we, uh, we we try. There's five plus members that are a part of this, and we're we're we're, we were drilling down into everything with 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 that effect. And basically, we also, the ISA with the standards, we began to develop in three groups. Here's the ANSI standard for the ISI with 6243, and how it's also tied in. And if you uh, up to date to the uh, one that's put out, documented ISA 9 or uh, IC 62443 is uh, quoted quite a bit in there. My classroom. I, I try to set it up in a way, and it looks like this example here. And also work with the reporter up in our, uh, for our security class, that's the Cisco uh, certifications. That um, 
we'll work with it in any way possible to kind of actually see an actual real work society where you have a technician and then talk to someone on the IP that only knows really what an IP address is, they necessarily always know what's connected to the IP address. You know, it, and that, you can't always just cut it off or paint and make sure it's there. So we, we do work with them. We kind of do some cross training that way between his program and mine. And if you look right here in the industrial enterprise and industrial networks, that's mainly in my classroom. That's where my students live. Uh, Robert Wood, if I if I you can uh, I can give you control back and I can kind of show you where those classes where that breaks down at. Do it, Matthew. Hang on a second. Okay. okay, Cheryl and Robert, you guys should be presenters now. Share top. You got it. Coming up. Right, it's black. Hang on, no. There we go. Okay. And uh, really, it's, with the, the way things are moving now, I mean, you got you got the addresses down to the sensor level now. And what I mean by that is, uh, it's, it's like for your instrument that it's actually doing the measurement and controlling of the process. So and that's through various protocols. And so I teach our technicians now what the address scheme it is and why is it there and why is there a submask and why do you put all this stuff into the sensors now? Where before it was a simple analog 4 to 20 amp signal. Or is a chain slowly to this, but there's still a lot of those day systems out there that actually have. Um, legacy equipment still running on that with this uh, IP address on serial IP type uh, connection to it. That's what it comes to the IP address. It's going to take that it's there. So we have to make sure. And that we've done different things for us, security for us. Cause, you know they have their own laptops. You know for us, uh, the biggest put down industry is don't pick up a thumb drive and put it into your your local laptop or computer or your uh, and see, when Robert showed that picture of the uh, debtor, I mean, a lot of times they have a computer sitting right there next to them so they can check their email. Don't just put a thumb drive into that. We made a, a – Cheryl, did you ever get that uh, video I sent you to? Yes, I did, Matt. Uh, with, uh, I, uh, I'll be more – well, I don't know if, I, if the voice that the sound would come across, but we can show that video if you want. I'm not sure we'd have enough time today. Make okay. it available to, uh, to yeah, share. I can, I can email that link out. It's, it's on YouTube. That uh, my students came from my students out of my cybersecurity class made a video to uh, help me present with a, a conference that I had, and they got together and made this video. And it's been used. That, that, there's a few companies that, uh, here in the state of Oklahoma, like a lecture company here in the state of Oklahoma, the uh, OG&E, is for the training purposes. Um, so that's good accolades for students to get, and it gets their names out there, and it's helped them out and other, other, uh, with other means. But in a process of control in a lot of industry, it's, I mean, if you want to go with OG&E, you got to think a lot of their old meter readers Jobs are going away, do SCADA, and there. But what that does is open up another job within the, the smart meter at your house. That still has a sort of an IP address, and it's then that's linked to your house. That is a potential uh, access point. So then when they go and they put those meters in, now they got to do certain things to set them up, and there is a password that goes on there, so you don't make any changes. They got to make sure they have to do all that stuff correctly. On SCADA fundamentals and SCADA applications, cybersecurity and SCADA systems is uh, basically what we had to put on top of our instrumentation program in order to get this to bring help bring those uh, students up to speed. 
Security because uh, we were talking about this five years ago, how big a hot top it is, and it's nothing but multiplied a year. And, uh, I just, I'm just i just really hoping that industry is really trying to catch up, but I don't know if there's quite the push yet, but hope in the future there will, will be. Uh, Casey, are you seeing anything from my end? Yep, it's good. We're on the SCADA manufacturing and engineering systems emphasis slide. Well, let's be seeing a stored uh, issue because my computer just crashed and is now rebooting. <laughs> okay, so you want to go ahead and um, you want to talk us through while it's um, while, or hang on. Actually, I think I have your slide, so give me a second and I will pull them up. And I will. Yeah, on the work. slide that I was on. Sure. So you want me to go to? So hang on. Let me resources. Uh, the PowerPoint. The one says DVD ISO image file. Right. right. Let's go ahead and uh, jump right into that. Cause that's why okay. uh, everybody's really looking for here is the resources. Okay. okay. Let me. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, basically on this uh, ISO image that I have on my uh, OneDrive download, it's uh, close to four gig. Has all the uh, all the resources that I developed for the three day instructor training workshop, uh, plus also the resources we developed for the uh, two uh, SCADA uh, that we're doing for business and industry, the oil and gas industry. All the uh, all the resources we developed that, plus uh, a bunch of other resources that I found that are available, you know, for, out there on the web. But uh, you know, instead of you having to go manually search and hunt and try to find for these, I tried to pull in all the available resources that I thought were relevant for the topic uh, and put together on that. Great. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. So on the next slide, Mike, Con that's so, the contents one. Yeah, the contents. Yeah, that shows actually what's on there. So if you're looking at that, uh, you can see uh, all the different ones. Of course, uh, those those are hyperlinks. If if my computer were working, where I could actually take you in and show you each of those, but we don't need to do that here because you'll be able to go in and download that. Okay. okay. Next slide. Next slide. Contact information. That's the last slide. Did you want me to go uh, ahead and click on any of the links to show folks some of the content? There's a slide that shows the OneDrive link. Yep, got that one. Okay, so that that's the key one. And you know, if you uh, are familiar with OneDrive, it does require a Microsoft account to be able to uh, download it. Uh, if you run into any issues downloading it, just uh, shoot me an email. That you have my contact information there. And we'll figure out another way of getting it to you. That's the one issue. Our CSEC website is not set up to handle large uh, file downloads. So the quickest way I could think of to share it with everybody was just put it out on my OneDrive account. Okay. And I post that URL in the chat um, in the chat window for those that are logged in via uh, WebEx. And again, we will be making these slides and this recording available. Um, in a week or so, you check your inboxes for future invites as well as uh, links to today's recording and, and the PowerPoints themselves. Uh, I think I have uh, to talk about and back on track. We need to get I think we're ready to go ahead and turn it over to Nick. Okay, Nick. All right. Let me find and. Nick, you are now the presenter. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Um, my name is Nick Gaunt. Um, I work at Central Tech in Germanwright, Oklahoma, um, one of our technology centers as part of CSEC Consortium. I um, started into the cybersecurity realm back in 2004. Um, and been with it ever since. Um, one of the things we quickly discovered in um, the IT realm is 
you know, quickly the technology changes, how quickly the curriculum becomes outdated. Uh, and we have to deal with a lot of issues that um, have to do with um, um, being, being relevant uh, information, getting that to students so that it translates directly to on-job experience. Um, CSEC Consortium has been great for that. Uh, we meet quarterly um, through the year to, to uh, meet with who are kind of in the same scenario we are um, about the curriculum. Um, we do a lot of resource sharing, um, planning, developing, trying to uh, stay ready. And one of the things that we adopted early on was Moodle. Uh, Moodle is a learning management system that is open source. Um, there are a lot of different learning management systems out there that um, very edge uses. Um, the thing I liked about the Moodle was with it being source, it was something that um, no matter of the CSEC members was, they could afford to, you know, if they put it on a server in their own classroom and just be able to run it. Um, and so over the years, we've been developing uh, um, content that, that to use in Moodle. Um, and then the, the, everything changing so quickly in the technology, it allows us to, um, as a community, to try to keep to date. And so, um, and then share the, the work out. And so we'll kind of divvy up the workload. So um, this is our mood site. Hopefully everybody sees uh, my desk. <laughs> Not Syntec Moodle. <laughs> but, Good. Uh, um, brought me in an off moment. We uh, were actually in the middle of upgrading our Moodle server from a earlier version to this latest one and uh, the migration did not go well the first time and uh, um, our site a little bit more raw than it typically is um, but in see Moodle this is this is what it looks like uh, um, we have campuses, we have three instructors teaching this, two at Germont campus, one at the Sepulpa campus. And um, we can do our own resource sharing on the server here, and then I can also link this out for other CSEC members to be able to connect to and use these resources as well. Um, but a variety of topics, This um, I don't have all the courses in here yet. But, uh, we, three-year program that we use with high school students, uh, probably 90% of our students are, uh, secondary education, they'll be juniors or seniors in high school. Uh, and we'll start them out with a base of um, computer repair networking. And so um, we have a computer repair one and two course, intro to networking. Um, and we use a variety of resources on that. Uh, using Cisco curriculum, using um, the CIA um, repository and things like that. And um, sometimes these resources are out there. They're in book um, a lot of times. Sometimes you get a question bank with it. So a lot of effort that goes into these courses into something usable in the learning management system. And so um, we I'm trying to develop those out, trying to make it work for exactly what's in our class. So with a high school student, we're going with um, maturity levels, not quite as high as we'd hope it to be. Uh, and so a lot of times we have to um, develop the courses on a basis that's going to tell them exactly what to do and when to do, do it. We kind of ease them out into more of a project base. Here's what I need done. Here's when I need it done by. You know, so, you know, a basic course in ours to start with is going to be laid out and it's going to have, you know, day one, 
items um, in day three. We are open entry, open exit, and so we will have students um, start in August traditional sense, but we'll get them all the way up to we have one starting next week. So. Um, has some help guide students through uh, the day-by-day -day process, helps us keep our sanity as far as keeping track of um, these students spread throughout nine different curriculums um, and keeping where they are. So, um, of course, really, I find a first-year student um, and get them into um, more objects. We've had them in the class for a year. Um, start breaking it uh, more in the traditional sense, um, maybe by modules, things like that. So, um, um, any topics to go through? We'll take them after the computer repair networking, start taking them into the security topics. Um, the thing about the original titles that uh, the CSET conversion used, um, still covering those same titles, we just try to put them into a terminology that uh, uh, might understand a little bit better. So instead of a um, the course, you know, we're going to have a Windows security, Linux security, network security. Um, Uh, certified ethical hacker and uh, the other one. I don't have it in here yet, but um, all the resources I can simply take any one of these. If, if one of our uh, is, uh, um, helps out, like if they're a new teacher, just came to the program, not exactly sure um, how they're going to roll things out. It's a turnkey system. I can back it up here. That they can um, restore it on their course and run with it. And uh, Moodle's being modeled the way it is. It's fantastic that you can uh, use the parts you like. You can discard the parts you don't like. Um, add more to it. Um, you know. And we just try to keep uh, open mind about. You know, if you develop something, you know, if you use my course and you like things, but you you like to add this and this to it, it's like, you know, share back. Um, they probably have some resources that I would like to have. So really trying to community develop out of this um, and hopefully looking at uh, Moodle has a hub system where you can actually take your developed courses, upload it to almost kind of like a storefront uh, where other people could go to that hub and be able to download it uh, without contacting um, the author um, directly to get it from them. So uh, what my, my talk was was covering Moodle resources that we have developed. Like I said, there we we have some others. Um, really, to work with uh, NetLab materials as well, develop them into a course that um, allow me to um, assign out to the students, be able to put grades on them, students be able to track their progress, um, and only get them. Um, for an industry certification matching the course and go get certified and go get jobs. So, uh, any questions about that? Let me second, Matt, thank you. I'm going to make myself presenter again real quick. Let me screen. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is go ahead and Take a mute. Uh, for, hopefully, this won't get too crazy. So, folks can ask questions if it 
Don't getting loud. People can mute themselves. Are there any questions? Cheryl, Robert, Nick? I have a question. So go ahead. If, if you go ahead and state your name and talk nice and loud for us, please. My name is Deanne Wesley. And I am interested in uh, um, um, the digital forensic knowledge that wanted to use the Moodle uh, shell, uh, that those resources is available. And I also wanted to know if the answer is yes, then is it an easy convert to uh, Blackboard, or would you have to use the Moodle? Um, the, uh, the that are in it, um, we're using, uh, FK, um, from Access Data, using their curriculum that came with it. Um, so a lot of my resources on that are just, um, buying what's, what's in the book, what's, what the labs that they have in it, having them upload their materials to it. So, um. It's mostly just drop box and quiz questions. I would think that would convert fairly easy for Blackboard. Go um, so in Moodle, all the quiz questions have a, a, a Blackboard export capability. That's probably the major work. The drop box is not that hard to create. Yeah. Um, are available for consumer members. Is that correct? I'm going to answer that one. <laughs> uh, yes, we can uh, definitely work something out. Uh, we'd probably need to coordinate with uh, Casey on just how we'd need to do that the, the most effective way. Any other? Thank you. That. Any other questions? For any of the presenters. Hi, this is Cheryl in Owensboro, Kentucky, and I have a question about the uh, digital forensics. Uh, okay, you're using Access Status Curriculum. Are you using their academic licensing uh, for FTK and uh, using a license server through them? Yes, we, we are using their academic that allows uh, 30 license um, and using their, their book curriculum. Um, I will warn you, they're, they're not updated the curriculum in a few years, and it's getting a little dated. So we, okay, I teach this. Uh, I teach this also, and I use the Cengage textbook, but I have access to the academic license through the, um, you know, through the license server where I also have 30 user licenses. However, you know, that is questionable each year whether I will be able to get that or not. It's like I have to wait until the last minute. Do you... Uh, through this consortium, can we use your lab content, but yet our own curriculum? I mean, can we have your have our students connect to your license server to obtain the license? I understand what you're 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 asking there. Um, I'm fairly certain that would not sit well with access data and their licensing. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably true. I currently have it uh, in FTK installed on a virtual desktop, and then I have my students to access through the virtual desktop. But another question: uh, Do you do anything with mobile forensics? Can you we picked up the MPE this year for the first time, um, and their curriculum, uh, um, there's a lot of development that needs to be done with it. 
um, from from teaching perspective, of we do a lot of hands-on labs, um, you know, and a little bit of theory, all theory in the curriculum, and not a whole lot of lab. And so, um, it, to fully implement that, it's really going to take some creative. Uh, creating something that's a little more rich in content. The the program itself is fantastic. The curriculum's a little light. Thank you. Thank you. Any any other questions for any of the panelists? Hearing this is Casey with the National Cyber Watch Center. I'm showing the slide on the SCADA manufacturing. Um, so, um, and uh, how do so let me back up here. This content here, um, Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, really the emphasis of your program is really on, on pipeline um, control security. Is that correct? Um, no, actually, this one at Francis Tuttle, he focuses more on the manufacturing and energy sectors. Okay, so this is separate. So this is manufacturing and energy. Okay, good. So that answered my question. Uh, as a, let me, and then you had a different one for. Um, uh, got it. Okay, thank you for that for clearing that up. Good questions. Cheryl, and sure. I'm going to ask Matt to actually comment really on the technician who goes through his programs typically and really the need in the industry. I visited his program just probably a couple of weeks ago, and it is at capacity because there's a great need for these technicians, SCADA technicians and industrial control technicians uh, in Oklahoma. So, Matt, could you comment on that for a moment? Uh, my student makeup right now is, uh, I would say, probably in the neighborhood 60 percent uh, as far as high school. I'm a, I've got high school and adults. I've got about, I'd say my population of high school is probably around 15 percent. And then and, but 60% of my adults are vets. So a great relationship with the VA here in Oklahoma City. A lot of vets to us, and a lot of vets want to come here. But the uh, prices are falling. Uh, there's those there for the SCADA jobs. They're still they're still needed because all these pipelines still have to flow gas, and they still got to flow crude oil or NDL or and you got all those plants along the way, and been stated numerous and numerous documents. You have your baby boomers leaving, and they have a mass exodus right now, especially in INE, because INE was traditionally grown up, and that was a nation type job within the workplace, or it's not you, right before you become management. And a lot of those baby boomers are leaving in the way as far as even manufacturing all the way to well, there's uh, a team. We, we, for our program, we have students graduating in, in a three year lifespan that we can fill in one month. Ask uh, right, I have a, I have a contact uh, I'm here in the state of Oklahoma. Not to mention what you hit this up outside the state. We're sending people uh, sending people to Houston area, uh, all the way into Colorado, Kansas. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. And, and the, the the salaries are pretty good. I mean, you got you, you, for instance, I had a student leave here as a high school student. One high school, one a high school, paying for his schooling. Is making about eighty-five thousand dollars a year one year out of high school. Uh, 
to sell me on why I have a, a master's degree, I will never know. But uh, it's an incredible thing for us to level on what they're paying these individuals to have those skills is very powerful. Great questions. And um, just a couple things to wrap up. So the next webinar is March 27th, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And the topic is Making Sense of Virtualization Degree Certificates, Certifications for Colleges, Universities. And this is a look at various, uh, a couple models that exist um, at the two and four year level uh, around virtualization technology. So server desktop infrastructure virtualization um, from vendors like VMware, Citrix, um, storage providers, EMC, et cetera. And uh, that, that promises to be an excellent, excellent webinar. And, and one last thing, which is just check your inbox for future webinar invitation and links to today's recording. So the um, National Cyber Watch Center, let me pull up the website here, is nationalcyberwatch.org, and it's going through a bit of a, of a, of a revamp, um, but there is a programs link in the upper right that will take to the various programs, one of which is the webinar series. And in about a month, we'll have a sub-page uh, built out for the webinar series where we'll actually list the topics and have links to the recordings and any any of the presentation slides. So for the time being, until, until this site gets fully built out, um, we'll be sending links to recording and and um, and presentation slides via email. So that's the official program. I want to thank our presenters, Cheryl Hale, Robert Hamilton, both from the Oklahoma Department of Career Tech and the Cybersecurity Education Consortium, of course, Matthew Maynard from Francis Tuttle Technology Center, and Nick Gaunt from Central Technology Center. I want to thank them. Um, appreciate it. And thank everybody for joining us, and uh, we'll see everybody in about a month. Take care. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you.